Hey everyone, Cleo here and today I'm going to be giving you guys recommendations for Japanese literature. Now I'll already begin by specifying that I'm talking about writers who are writing in Japanese, so books originally written in Japanese in translation at this point in time. I will not be going into diaspora writers, for example. Now, when it comes to Japanese literature, I am by no means an expert. I have so much Japanese literature that I still need to dive into, that I still want to dive into. For a very long time, my reading of Japanese literature was really just one author in particular, and it was just Haruki Murakami. So I read Haruki Murakami for the first time when I was 18, 19, when I was taking uh, Chinese, because we also had a class on Japanese culture, and for that class we had to read a Japanese book. And so I decided to read Sputnik Sweetheart by Haruki Murakami at that point in time. And you know, that story was just right up my alley. And so as a result, I read more and more Haruki Murakami over the years, but I never really ventured outside of the Haruki Murakami lane <laughs> until the time when I started to join booktube and was introduced to a lot more Japanese authors that are popular that have great works out there and so I started to read more and more and while I still feel like a little bit of an imposter talking about Japanese literature I did think that with six recommendations in this video I can already give a sort of first Japanese literature recommendation list in this list are going to be six works by six different authors. I specifically wanted to keep it to one book per author. For some of these authors, I will have only read one book, and so uh, that book impressed me enough for me to put it on this list. For others, I will have read many. For example, Haruki Murakami. I have definitely not read all of his works, but I have read some seven or eight of his works, and I will only be choosing one of them for this video purpose only. But so maybe for the purposes of this video and what I've basically given as an introduction for this one, let's start with Haruki Murakami. So the book that I'm going to be recommending is basically one of the most recent ones of him that I have read. It's basically one that I read last year or two years ago maybe, and that is Colorless Sukura Tezaki and His Years of Pilgrimage by Haruki Murakami. Now, I don't see this one like recommended that often. I don't think a lot of people who love Haruki Murakami's writing will point you in the direction of this one. And I find that to be a total shame because I was definitely pleasantly surprised when I read this book. This book is unlike most of the Murakamis that I've read. I've mainly read some of his more weirder stuff because Haruki Murakami has this sort of like magical realist style in which most of the events taking place are quite realistic. However, they're always blended together with some surreal stuff. And it's usually one of these surreal elements that is the Kickstarter to the story. However, that is not the case with Colorless Sukuro Tazaki. This is very much more of a realist story. There's only like one weird element to this story, I think, and that happens within a dream sequence, so it can easily just be seen as the weirdness of dreams themselves. Now, predictably, this story is all about Sukuro Tazaki. When Sukuro Tazaki was in high school, he was part of this tight-knit group of friends, and his four other friends all had a color in their name. As a consequence, he sort of labeled himself the colorless Sukuro Tazaki because he didn't have a color in his name, but also because he felt like his friends were very colorful, vibrant personalities, and that he, by contrast, was bland compared to them. And as a result, he often felt like he was just the presence that his friends were tolerating, like he wasn't an essential part of their friend group. And so he wasn't even surprised when he came back from university one day and none of his friends would talk to him anymore. He never really questions that act. He never really questioned them about what took place because he just assumed that this was going to happen sooner or later. However, a number of years have gone by and this experience has had a lasting impact on him. And so a person that he has started to date urges him to find out what happened, to go back to the town where he grew up, to seek out his past friends and find an explanation for what took place all those years ago. I think it's a beautiful novel and I just really related to the protagonist Sukuna Tazaki, really related to his struggle with anxiety, through the way in which he sees himself. And part of what really made this book stand out to me is, of course, also that it 
really felt fresh compared to most of the other Murakamis that I've been reading. A lot of Murakami novels kind of blend into one after a while because he has such a distinctive style and because most of his protagonists are very similar. And I wouldn't necessarily say that Tsukuru Tazaki is a very different protagonist to some of his other protagonists. However, just the sheer fact of the storyline developing in a very different way made it made the story seem very fresh, made me really reappreciate Murakami's writing style all over again. Second book to talk about is one that is definitely blowing up in recent years on booktube as well, and that is Before the Coffee Gets Cold by Toshikazu Kawaguchi. So this is a pretty short book. A lot of Japanese literature is actually pretty short. I think Murakami is often quite an exception compared to a lot of the Japanese books that I've recently been reading. And it is basically a sort of short story collection almost because this book is basically divided in four sections that can be read as four separate stories. But the central unifying element to these stories is the time traveling cafe. So in one cafe in Tokyo, you can travel back in time. Now, traveling back in time, however, has a lot of rules linked to it within this book. One of them being that you need to return before the coffee gets cold or otherwise you will be turned into a ghost. But the main problem when it comes to the rules of traveling back in time is that no matter what you do in the past, it won't change the present. So it is not like you can go back into the past and warn somebody about an accident that will end up happening because they will still end up dying. No matter what you do in the past, the present will still roll out in the same way. And as a result, not a whole lot of people go back in time. Why would you go back in time if you cannot change the present? However, this is what the story is going to dive into. In four different stories, we will be seeing people go back into the past and we will start to uncover the very human emotional side to why you would want to go back into the past. It is a beautiful story. It definitely is emotional in parts and it has a simplicity and style that is very calming, very soothing, and that makes those emotions stand out even more. The sequel to this one is also out. So we do have Before the Coffee Gets Cold, Tales from the Cafe, which uh, has four further tales to it. The reception for that is quite mixed. I've seen a lot of people be disappointed in it, saying that it's just more of the same and that they didn't feel like it was necessary. I, on my side, actually might have enjoyed the sequel more. I definitely felt like the sequel was able to add on to the original and give some further background to some of the characters that we meet in the first book that made me kind of reevaluate what was going on in the first one to begin with. Next up, another writer that has definitely been popular up a lot on booktube as well recently and that is Yoko Ogawa. Now I will be talking about a different book than the one that has been doing the rounds. So the book that I will be recommending is The Housekeeper and the Professor by Yoko Ogawa. The book that is mainly being talked about recently is The Memory Police which is her most recent release and I have yet to read it. I definitely want to um, however with my current book buying ban I have not been able to prioritize purchasing it but definitely one day I will get around to The Memory Police. The Housekeeper and the Professor has similar themes, I would guess, because it also deeply dives into memory. In The Housekeeper and the Professor, we are looking at the relationship between these two characters. The Professor is this character who used to be a professor. He used to be a professor of mathematics, and he definitely could be considered a sort of mathematical genius. However, at some point, an accident took place and he lost his memory. He now only has access to 80 minutes of memory. So after 80 minutes, that first minute is overwritten by the new minutes and so he always has a constant access of 80 minutes of memory. As a result you would think it's difficult to build lasting relationships. How do you build lasting relationships when you cannot remember the people that you meet? And the professor will have all of these sort of like notes on his body at all times that will remind him of certain things enter into his life the housekeeper. The housekeeper is not the first housekeeper to be assigned to the professor's household. However, she's the first one that will really click. She and the professor hit it off right away. The relationship that builds between them is very wonderful and it's a relationship that builds through the language of mathematics. It's probably difficult to imagine how interesting mathematics can seem after reading this book, but I promise you guys, 
I mean, I do like mathematics, but I know a whole lot of people who aren't great at maths, who don't really like the subject, but who have read this book and found themselves very much interested in the subject matter. The sort of passion with which the professor speaks on mathematics just makes it seem so interesting. And the way in which he uses mathematics to get to know the housekeeper and the way in which house, the housekeeper on her side then also becomes intrigued with mathematics and does research outside of the time that she spends with the professor is just beautiful. A beautiful story showing how relationships can be built even when one of the partners in the relationship does not have access to the memories of what has taken place, to memories of past discussions, of past actions that, have, that they have shared. Next up, we have The Traveling Cat Chronicles by Hiro Arikawa. Now, this is a book that is just a delight. It's just such a beautiful comfort blanket to read. However, at the same time, it is also a heartbreaking read. Now, for those of you hesitant to dive in because you don't want to see animal cruelty or you don't want to see animal death featured within the book, that is not what is going to happen within this book. And actually, the cat itself isn't necessarily the central focus of this book, neither. So this story is told from the perspective of a cat. The cat, Nana, is a street cat who basically is content with her life so far. She gets food from one of the neighbors from time to time and she can sit on his silver van and sleep there whenever the car is parked there. However, one day she gets hit by a car and the friendly neighbor Satoru takes her in. Initially, Nana can't wait to get back out onto the streets. However, soon a deep bond between the two of them grows. The main bulk of the story, however, takes place at a future point in time in which Satoru is taking Nana around to meet potential new owners. He goes and visits multiple of his past friends in order to see if they are a match with Nana or not. And through these trips, we will mainly be diving into the past of Satoru and his relationships with these different characters. And it's very much focusing on human interaction, human relationships and flawed human communication, flawed human interaction. And so a lot of the essence of this book is about human interaction. And the sort of viewpoint of the cat kind of helps highlight the way in which human interaction, human communication can be flawed because of our emotions. It is a beautiful story. I definitely cried while reading this one and I highly recommend you guys to pick it up. Moving on to the final two books within this video and these two are the ones that I had like mixed experiences with. It wasn't an all out success. I didn't read this book, like I didn't devour these books from start to finish. I potentially had big problems with part of the book, but by the final page I ended up falling in love with these books and these books have had such a lasting impression on my mind. These two are probably the two books on here that have stuck with me the most of this entire list. These are the ones that I still think about from time to time or even quite regularly. And the first one of these is the one that I finished most recently and that will be Tokyo Ueno Station by Yu Miri. So this is the first book that I actually finished this month in the month of May and while I was reading I didn't necessarily love it. I didn't hate it neither, but I felt like I was missing so much context when it came to this book, which is on me because of course this is a book translated from Japanese, so the original audience for this will have gotten a lot more of that background, will have understood a lot more of what was inferred by the text, of what was in the background of this text, and I just felt like I was missing some of those things and as a result some of the scenes lost some of its power. However, at the end of the story, when the story completes, you are given an author's note, you're actually given two author's notes and a translator's note. And those changed my entire view on this book because some of the backgrounds that I had in church that I was picking up on, that I already thought was interesting. but. Another big part of this was missing. And so one key element that was being discussed about, I hadn't really understood the huge impact that that had on that story. And so it is after reading the author's note and the translator's note that I really understood all of the criticism, all of the things that this story was diving into, and that I really understood that there was just so much more to this story than what I, as a Western reader, had been able to dive into on my own, based on my own understanding of Japanese society, Japanese history. And so I highly encourage you guys to pick this one up. What is it about? <laughs> Maybe should have said that as well. So this is a story told from the perspective of our protagonist called 
So this is a story told from the perspective of our protagonist, Kazu. Now, Kazu is a little bit unlike other protagonists in the sense that he has passed away at the beginning of this book. Kazu's spirit is realming Tokyo Ueno Station, the place where he has spent the last years of his life. The park around Tokyo Ueno Station is apparently a place where a lot of homeless people in Tokyo end up spending their time. A lot of tents are put up in that park. A lot of people take permanent residence there. However, throughout the book, we'll also see that they're often removed from the park because the emperor is visiting, for example. And as also explained within the author's note, this park has also been cleared out leading up to the 2021 Olympic Games. Now, this book will move back and forth between Kazu's memories of his past life, of the life he was leading before he ended up in Tokyo Ueno Station, but also giving us insights in some of the relationships he built when he was living in Ueno Station Park. And the entire book is very much a criticism of events that have taken place on the way in which his life has constantly been a struggle, a fight against poverty. And so yeah, it was a very interesting read. And regardless of the fact that I felt like I was missing out on some of the background for a big chunk of this book, I did definitely also have parts in this book that I absolutely loved that were so beautiful or that I really felt. There are definitely things for which you don't necessarily need the background to be able to feel them. However, that sort of vision on the scope of this book expanded immensely when I read the afterwards by the author. I would not suggest reading them before reading the book just because it does spoil something within the book and so I'm not entirely sure you would benefit from reading them before reading the book but I'm definitely interested in rereading this book now that I have more of the background that is needed to understand its full scope. And then the final book that I'm going to be talking about is probably the review up on my channel that has the most views. It's constantly popping up in the list of videos that is mostly being watched on my channel and I'm very happy about that and that would be Earthlings by Sayaka Murata. So if you would have asked me at the point in time in which I just finished Earthlings whether I preferred Convenience Store Woman or Earthlings, I would have had a difficult time choosing between them. At this point in time, it really is, isn't a competition at all. I have thought so much about Earthlings since finishing it. Earthlings has stuck with me so much that there is no contention, there is no competition between these two books. But Earthlings was a book that I had a very difficult experience with. It's a book that I almost put down when I was like 30% into it. I was severely uncomfortable with the subject matter of that first third of the book. And at that point in time, I was, I was absolutely convinced that I was going to be putting it down. However, we then get a time jump in which we move from a young narrator to an adult narrator and that made all the difference for me. So in Earthlings we follow our protagonist Natsuki. Natsuki has to deal with a lot of abuse in her childhood. She has to deal with the verbal abuse that is coming from her family who don't really seem to accept her, who seem to see her as the odd one out. As she in turn also comes to see herself. But she also has to deal with sexual abuse from a teacher at her school for example. The way that she comes to terms with the harshness of her reality is true imagination. She uses her imagination to reinterpret the world around her. The way in which she is different from people around her makes her think that she is an alien inhabiting a human body. Now, now, the first third of this book, as I said, is very uncomfortable to read because we have that childlike perspective. We have the point of view of a child living through some harsh reality, some hard experiences, and even though she will be interpreting them sometimes through a different lens because of that sort of imaginative aspect to the story, we as adult readers can pierce through those layers and understand what is actually happening as well as some of the actions that she herself take are also very difficult to read about. And one of the things happening within the storyline is that she develops a very close relationship with one of her cousins, a relationship that they take a little bit too far. As a result, she's very much the black sheep of the family. She and her cousin are kept apart from one another from that point onwards. And then we get a sort of time jump into her adult life. An adult Natsuki even though she has grown up and she seems to have settled down, she seems to have complied with the way in which society wants us to behave, in reality, she still very much holds true to the beliefs of her childhood. She still believes herself to be an alien. She still believes that she doesn't belong on Earth. She has, in the meantime, as I said, settled down. She has found somebody else who isn't interested in living a conventional life. 
and they have entered into a relationship together in order for their families to stop nagging at them for settling down. However, society is still not content. They now want to know when are you going to start having babies. And so the story in its turn addresses the difficulty of breaking the mold, the difficulty of stepping outside of those boundaries and the way in which society will not just simply let you do that. And the story takes a lot of turns, some interesting twists and turns, and it was just so interesting. And as I said, it has stuck with me ever since I finished it. I think about this book so many times and I am actually really wanting to rereading it. But so yeah, there we have it. Those are six Japanese books in translation that I highly recommend to you guys. I still have a huge list of books that I want to at some point dive into. I am reading another book of Japanese literature as well at this point in time. And so hopefully at some point in the future, I can give you a second video with further recommendations for Japanese literature. Japanese literature is definitely a style of writing that absolutely suits my reading taste. And so I'll always be looking for more and I'll always be wanting to dive into more of those books. And with that in mind, definitely do feel free to leave me some recommendations down below. What are some books of Japanese literature that you recently read that you think I might enjoy? Definitely leave me your recommendations down in the comments below and I'll add them to the very long list at this point in time. But so yeah guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and see you guys for a future one. Bye!